it is remarkably an incredibly important concept that is at the heart of our theories of how the universe and how matter behaves and yet we don't understand it. Well, you know, I actually teach this to the first year undergraduates and what I tell them is that if they think they've understood it, then they probably haven't. We can't measure it, we can't observe it and that's not because our instruments aren't good enough, it's just fundamentally built into the theory. We cannot see a wave function. That's a cool symbol. It is a cool symbol indeed, so it looks like a, looks like a pitchfork. At the very microscopic scale, the world becomes very fuzzy. Um, and so particles that, you know, that we like to think of, electrons and protons, that we sort of like to think of as little billiard balls, don't behave that way at all. They, don't, they no longer have a well-defined position in space, for example. They kind of spread out a bit. And you can't say in a very fundamental way exactly where a particle is. It could be here, it could be here, it could be here. And so the only way you can actually express um, that, you know, that physically what's going on is to associate a probability. You say, well, you know, it's a high probability that it's here and there's a low probability that it's here, but you can't say for definite exactly where a particle is. And the wave function is just really the mathematical way of expressing that probability of where the particle actually is in space. Oh, the wave function is the version of quantum mechanics invented by Owen Schrodinger. And it's uh, a complex quantity, which I don't want to go into, but actually the wave function is related to the probability of finding a particle somewhere. But the more complicated thing was Schrodinger's life. In 1938, I think, he was invited to Oxford by Lindemann and travelled there with his wife and his girlfriend and set up a menage, menage a trois. Two women and him living together in the same household. And when Lindemann and others found out about it in Oxford, he uh, was invited to leave and, and found himself uh, just before the outbreak of the Second World War in Germany. He was rescued there by the Irish who spirited him out to Dublin and he spent the war there uh, with his wife and he managed to get another mistress, an Irish girl, pregnant and he, his wife and this Irish girl brought up the baby themselves. So he had a very, very complicated life which was probably typical of quite a lot of German scientists from Berlin at the time. Berlin in the 30s being quite a racy place. It's our quantum theory has at its core, and the wave function has at its core, the idea of an imaginary number, the idea of the square root of minus one. And so we are using, it seems absolutely mad to somebody who isn't a mathematician or a physicist, it seems bizarre, and it is mad in some respects when you think about it, that we're using imaginary numbers, square root of minus one, something that cannot exist in the real world to describe reality. And that's, that, that's absolutely remarkable. And so we can certainly on a computer plot out, we can take molecules and we can look, maybe if you want to come over here, we can plot out, and this is actually some work from collaborators in, in Cork in something called the Tyndall Institute, and I have to thank somebody called Jakob Barron for this, but what you can see here is, is a molecule, in this case it's C60, C60 is a wonderfully symmetric molecule, it's like a, um, basically a molecular football, and we can take that map and we can convert that mathematically into a map that then tells us what the probability of finding an electron is. What do those blobs represent then? And so those blobs represent the wave function itself. Represent, well here, the wave function is positive, here the wave function is negative, here's how the, the wave function spreads out across the molecule. And so for example there's a classic experiment in physics called the, the, the young slit experiment, the double slit experiment which you can do with particles, you can do with particles like electrons and basically you have a beam of electrons firing along and a pair of little slits and the electrons go through and very fundamentally because the electrons position is not defined you can't say which slit it goes through it goes through both this is one particle going through two holes at the same time particles really aren't supposed to behave that way or at least on the macroscopic scale are things we're used to dealing with and that's why the concepts are so incredibly difficult to explain because you have to accept that at some very fundamental level that that's the way the universe works one thing you might do if you were doing this double slit experiment with a particle going through is say, okay, so why don't I just set up some very clever little gizmo which will actually measure whether or not a particle goes through one slit or the other. And then I can actually say which slit the particle goes through. And the amazing thing is, whatever thing you set up to, to detect which slit the particle has actually gone through, you can detect it. But then suddenly all the quantum mechanical effects go away. That suddenly the particle, yes, you can detect it and it only ever, when you actually make the measurement, it only ever goes through one slit but suddenly all the quantum mechanical effects go away. And that's this thing of collapsing the wave function. When you make a measurement, you go from a probabilistic thing, well, either the particle's here or the particle's here, to saying, on this occasion, the particle is definitely here. Doesn't that mean you just solve the puzzle? What other quantum mechanical effects have gone away? So, 
let's go back to this twin slit thing again. If you don't make that measurement of actually saying which slit did the electron go through, because the electron then goes through first, and because it's behaving like a wave, when it comes out the other side, the two waves interfere with one another. And so you actually see interference effects between the two waves. You see, basically, you see fringes. If you ever do, if you have a, a, a tank of water and you just make ripples in it, and you'll see that the waves travel through each other, but as they're traveling through each other, they interfere, and in some places you get big waves, and in other places you get no waves at all. And you can do exactly the same thing with this double slit experiment. You can get the, the electrons to interfere with each other and produce these wave patterns that you'd, you see, as you see in, in, in tanks of water. Um, but the amazing thing is that you can do it one electron at a time. So one electron can interfere with itself as long as you don't do this thing of collapsing the wave function. So if you leave it as a wave function, you can actually get one electron to interfere with itself. And so that really is a fundamentally associated with the wave function um, and that gives you a really in sense that the wave function in some sense is the real particle. That's what's really going on. I think quantum mechanics is so totally counterintuitive that it seems stupid to everybody. It looks at first sight as though it can't be right. The problem with it is, okay, so that's fine. I can explain it and they'll nod and as you've been nodding and they're all, you know, they're happy with the explanation. But then the way physics works is, so you have, to you, know, you have to solve some problems. We set them an exam question, or they've got some physics experiment they're doing, they're trying to understand, or whatever. And you get to the end of an experiment, or you get to the end of an exam question, the first thing you should do is look at the answer and think, does that make sense? Because almost always in physics, if you've got an answer that sort of makes no sense at all to you, you've probably done something wrong and you need to look back up the calculation or play with your apparatus some more to try and find out where you might have made a mistake. The terrible thing about quantum mechanics is it because it predicts such completely counterintuitive things, you know, you can have particles in two places at once, you can actually have particles tunneling through solid walls and so on, do you end up with a result at the end that you think, that can't be right. And bizarrely in quantum mechanics, if you get to an answer at the end that says, that can't be right, then you probably have got it right. But that makes it very hard for, to really grasp it, to really understand the subject, because you always end up with these completely counterintuitive answers at the end. Why should you introduce this wave function when in the world we live in, the world with everything is uh, large scale and uh, cricket balls, especially for Australia that swing around the place, or uh, classical objects such as a book that can fall on your foot. It, it doesn't really matter whether you're using uh, any other language, you're always going to think of these as material objects. But when you get down to the tiny, the very small, such as an electron or a neutrino, you have to describe it in terms of a wave function because it is not. Pri um, it, it's obeying a completely different set of laws of motion. And it's when you go from the very small and you aggregate these particles together that out of that emerges the classical world in which we live. So it's hidden from us because we only see things on a large scale. I certainly got be to see those huge paintings by Monet. Enormous things that cover a wall, and as you go close to it, you can see it's all blurry and fuzzy. And in that sense, when you go back from the picture, you see the garden or the water lilies. And, and if you're up close, you magnify it closely. It hasn't got the behaviour of being a, a classical picture. It has the impression of being broken up into little daubs here and there. And, and the genius of Monet was to be able to have a huge picture on the wall, enormous, much bigger than the, the size of one of these walls, and to stand back from it and see how he could go forwards and paint a little daub there and it would add to part of the picture. I can't imagine how he can do that. Well, in quantum mechanics, it's a bit like that. You have to stand back from it, look at the whole picture, and then imagine that you can put a little daub somewhere, the quantum mechanical wave function, such that when you go back to the realistic world, you, the world we live in, uh, I mean, the world we live in, not the realistic world, the world we live in, then this little quantum mechanical wave function could add up to an atom inside a cricket ball or an electron inside a cricket ball and become the microscopic object we normally see. Everyone loves quantum mechanics. It's the, uh, probably in the first year in the core physics that they do. So I, I teach two things in the core physics to the first year, which are special relativity and quantum mechanics. And I have to say I have the best job in the first year because it's the physics everyone wants to learn about and everyone goes, uh, about. So, you know, it's really fun to teach. The students really enjoy it. And it's one of those things, you know, people have this idea that students are kind of lazy and want to do the easy stuff. Actually, what they really like is this stuff, and it's hard.